everybody, and welcome to this uh, brand new spoiler review episode for Andor here from the Geek Buddies. <gasps> hey! Yeah. We're going to break this whole episode down from back to front, or from front to back and back to front, and have some fun breaking every single event that happened on massive heist here, some reveals, some. Uh, some double turns, some people stabbing each other in the back, some craziness, and some predicted deaths, uh, shall we say, in this whole thing. So we are going to spoil it, so uh, turn back now if you haven't seen it, uh, and come back and join us after you have. But let's introduce ourselves. I'm the outlaw, John Roker, writer, producer, and host here on The Geek Buddies. Mike? I am Michael Vogel. I'm a writer and producer of animated TV shows and movies. Shannon. And this is Shannon McClung. I'm an animation writer and a television actor where you can see some of our current work on Netflix right now with Strawberry Shortcake, Barry in the Big City, Season 2. Yeah, maybe a heist will show up in that one in one of the episodes. That could be Actually, oh. actually, <laughs> Mr. Shannon McClung, when I was like, would you like to write a Christmas episode in Season 2, asked if he could do an Ocean's Eleven style heist. Wow. And he did. So... Nice. You can check out Shannon McClung's uh, Barry themed heist on Netflix right now on season two of nice. Barry in the Big City. That's Mission awesome. Unfrostable. Oh, that is that's the name of the. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. I can't wait to see that. It's great. <laughs> uh, and a big shout out, of course, to Carbon Health, who continues his power and sponsor us here on the Geek Buddies. Head over to carbonhealth.com if you've got any healthcare questions, concerns, or needs. Download their app so you can have a doc in your pocket. They've got 100 plus locations. All over the country, 80 plus locations in California alone, urgent care, physical care, uh, virtual care, COVID tests, they got it all uh, to handle there. So go and visit them at carbonhealth.com. All right, some people got some blaster shots that might need some carbonhealth.com in this show for sure. Uh, Mike, let's start with you. Overall, what are your thoughts here as we look at episode six, The Eye? We've been leading up to this heist, so the heist finally happened. Thoughts overall in this episode? My thoughts are I'm bummed that Laura couldn't be here today because we finally got to the heist. Yeah, sadly, Laura has uh, had two. She's got two events that she's got to attend this week and next week, so she won't be joining us for either one of those two episodes. But after that, she'll be with us to finish Guys, out the ride. So. Laura's very popular. She's super popular. Very popular. Uh, yeah, so I'm bummed that she can't be here because I'm actually really, really curious uh, to chat with her about it. But Ooh. we got to the heist. So you were right. Uh, John was correct. It does really seem like Andor is doing like these three episode chunks, very reminiscent of how the Clone Wars did a lot of their storytelling. Yeah, and I love it. I love that with 12 episodes, we're basically getting call it four chapters, call it three mini movies. Um, but we're basically getting like we got that one movie that kind of got Andor. Uh, off of Ferrix and into the Rebellion. And then we got this movie that is all built around this big heist on Aldani. And for everything that we were talking about, about all of the setup in the past few weeks and really kind of getting to know the different rebels and all of the conflict of them figuring things out and Andor sort of stepping up and realizing that he's really got a better handle on this than everything else. And uh, Gore, not Gore, Gorn? Gorn, Gorn, yeah. the, Gorn. Uh, you know, Gorn kind of all of all of his stuff on being on the Imperial side and how he felt about that and his past with the Aldani, like all these pieces all paid off in the most satisfying way. And we saw this moment that kind of I feel like might be the first based on the reaction at the end, which we'll get to the first really, really major uh, event in mm. the rebellion. Yeah, uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, good point. Uh, Shannon, thoughts overall on this episode, The Eye? I mean, you're an action guy. A lot of action in this. Yeah, this was all really, really great. And again, I think we said it, said this after episode three as well. Like, you know, that that really extended action sequence they had, you can't do that in one episode. Like, yeah, yeah. It, what makes it so much more um, resonant with the audience is giving us time to get to know the people who are the player, who are the active players. So when someone does fall, it, it hits you a little bit harder. You, you know, you're just on everyone's side a lot more. And, you know, we've talked about them not using the volume before and how it's really working for this show. I mean, the whole, va all those shots of the Valley and the way that they're able to blend the effects yeah. with live action. I mean, it's so, so great. I mean, in the whole, uh, the eye celebration, I mean, that was just a uh, visual feast. I mean, it was yeah. just really, really satisfying. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm really curious where we're going because it's it seemed like Cassian was maybe on his path one way, but it sure seems like, nope, I'm I'm good. Like I did my job. I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. 
good ending. Uh, yeah, overall, loved it. Uh, just real quick, loved it. Thought it, the setup was really well done over the last three episodes is why we take our time. And I wonder if people are reassessing the first three episodes of this series now who are kind of saying it was a bit slow. We had to have time with him. We had to have time to understand him, connect with him, understand his world, see what motivates him, what drives him, what influences him, and really understand him so that when he starts to make the change, we have all this foundation to see how he's naturally making the change in a believable, organic way for the character that you've created. So I thought they really did a great job here, watching him come closer and closer to the rebellion, getting them X Manifesto, getting these kinds, getting these. Uh, uh, conversations with these other people who've dealt with the empire all of it there is going to influence him plus the direction here was absolutely stellar for the uh heist sequence the way it was all set up worked so well there were some easter eggs but not enough to overwhelm the fact that you were watching a pretty singular important event as michael just said earlier that could possibly be the thing that kicks off every the um, empire finally understanding how dangerous this rebellion actually is and starting to move into um, positions to try to counter this rebellion or destroy this rebellion, which we'll see over the next five years leading into a new hope. So just fantastic stuff. Let's jump into it here. We're going to break this thing down into sections, and uh, let's start at the beginning here. We have morning at the camp. We got Nemec and Andor are sharing a drink. We have conversations about the role of mercenaries in the struggle for freedom, and we see the idealism versus the realism, right? Nemec, nervous, didn't sleep at all last night. Uh, and or sleeping like a stone because he's been through this a number of times. So there's a difference. Sit at your desk and write all your manifestos, but putting, you know, anting up and getting in the fight, that's going to really show you what this is all about. So we're seeing their differences there. Then we cut to the Aldani base. Commander Jay Hold is talking to a new colonel here who is there to kind of invest, investigate stuff and inspect stuff. He's there with Gorn. They're talking about the Donnies, and it's pretty derogatory conversation about the Donnies, essentially calling them simple people, stupid people, easily swayed by alcohol, all these terrible things, the way they smell, all of it, just horrible, horrible stuff for the Empire. And it doesn't feel like it's being done to make it seem like we're mustache twirling. It actually feels very ugly and real, which makes it feel all the more unsettling when you're seeing it happen here. Uh, the other colonel asks if they know this will be their last time, the Donnies, uh, for coming in. Uh, but uh, he says that they'll return. They don't know. We don't need to tell them. There's no profit in that. Jay Holt says they'll return when you're ready to build the things that you want to build. Then we see um, uh, Jay Holt ask Gorn about the colonel if he believes the colonel will do this. He says, Look, you can't charm him. You got to let him uh, investigate this stuff. Then we cut back to uh, the, the people on Aldani there, the Aldani Seven, as I like to call them. Uh, we see that Terraman is calling for Echo One or the Battle Radio because they've all gotten together. They're all now marching in their outfits. They're with the Donnies. They're walking behind them. Uh, and so we're waiting on Val, and Val finally calls back in. We find out also from Skeen, when Andor and Skeen are talking, that Terraman was a former stormtrooper. little Finn action there, everybody. Uh, we got to Gorn and the Colonel on the platform. The eye event has started. We see it all going through. Uh, Vel and Sinta see some Imperial Guards walk up, but they just take a piss and walk off. They swim out to the base uh, and attach the things that they need to attach. We cut back to Jay Hold, who is there with his wife. And he claims that the belt has expanded somehow in transport, not his belly. And we meet his son as well, who does not want to wear the Imperial blouse. So we're laying the groundwork for this family being a part of this whole hostage situation. We see Gorn meeting the leader of the Donnies. They have an exchange about blessings. They exchange some um, uh, pelts, I guess you would say there. Uh, and then they walk you off. Uh, That's he, what they wear. Is what they, okay, okay. We see... Yeah, we see Gorn calls in the commandant, the commandant, and they all walk out talking about the stench of the Donnies, as I said. We cut to a platform where Kimsey is berating some of the running guards. As I said here, we got Vel and Sinta attached and the things that they attach. And then they have one last exchange, the commandant and the Donnie, and they leave the temple. Uh, and then Gorn sends the other soldiers down to the temple, and they walk in with the guys behind them. So that's what we've got the setup here right before everything kicks off. The four dudes are dressed as Imperial troopers there. They're from another planet, Al Al Alkazi, I think it is, or all the another location, Alkazi there. They're with the Donnies walking, and then eventually they're with the Commandant and his family walking back to the Aldani base. Vel and Sinta are out there where Kimsey is to, to set off the electrical stuff they're going to set off to mess with the comms, and, uh, and the Donnies are down there doing their thing. So that's the setup here. Michael, I'll go back to you. What do you think of this whole intro setup here? to uh, explain what's going to happen right before it starts to happen. Just well, set up. First right. of all, first of all, when you all leave comments today, 
Give John Roca a hand because going through all that plot is not easy. That not I easy. get stressed out. I get stressed out listening to him do it, and I watched the episode. But I would be like, so there was some coffee, and Nemec and Andor had a conversation, and somebody peed, and then there was some stars. <laughs> That's how I would do it. So, uh, so it, we're all very lucky. That. We're all very lucky that John is doing it and not me. Um, no, it was all great. I mean. I'm going to try and break this up into like big broad chunks, but like Andor and Nemec's conversation, obviously really, really important. And just kind of continuing this ideal, this idea of like, there's this kid who is this idealist. He's this true believer, but he's still really scared. Like there's, there's one thing to have these big, huge ideas about the way the world should be. Yeah. And then there's the reality of what you need to do to make it happen. And even his, his thoughts about maybe we need to be more like the empire and hire like the strongest people and the mercy and the this and the that like like he's just sort of struggling with the idealism versus the nitty-gritty and andor is very much in the nitty-gritty of it like he's like yeah. look the empire doesn't care about you but he even does tell him like you're gonna be okay it's gonna be fine but i think this is important because this is kind of what andor as a series is doing star wars as an idea has the rebellion and it sounds great we're we're sticking it to the empire they're the bad guys we're standing up for what's right we want everybody to have their rights and it sounds wonderful mm. how you actually accomplish that is not wonderful yeah. it is dirty and scary and horrible and this is what the show is doing like they're showing us the darker side of the rebellion the scarier side of it the fact that not everybody agrees the fact that you're really putting your life on the line like the and so for for a star and this is what rogue one did which is why so many people like it and andor is sort of just doubling down on that so look i love the 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 the, the fun part of the rebellion the yeah i'm a rebel uh, i'm rebel scum like i love that part of star wars but i also love that we're getting this other side of it and kind of opening this up with this conversation is really great um, to what you were saying about the Imperial office, officers not feeling mustache twirly and it feeling really kind of real and disgusting, that's because it's real. Yeah. What they are talking about with the Aldani people, uh, you know, kind of using their culture against them, plying them with alcohol, yeah. uh, the way Where they talk down before? on them, the way they think they're lesser than, yeah. it's the way the colonists treated the indigenous people when they came here, it's the way colonial British people, uh, uh, officers treated uh, people in India, yeah. uh, it's the way that the Chinese were treated, like, like, the white man has done this a lot throughout history, so what the Imperials are saying is not some made up, uh, villainous plot that they had to come up with they just opened a history book and said this is how people throughout history have been subjugated this is what the empire is doing um just the way that they talk about them kind of saying oh they they have such a hard time even making a choice so give them a bunch of options and they'll spend so much time worrying about which one they want to choose they don't even realize we're not giving them what they want and eventually we're going to not even let them come up here anymore and eh, it's fine who cares this is all gross and dirty and it smells bad anyway like it's it's disgusting in the casual nature in which they are throwing it out there um if they were more mustache twirly and were taking sort of an evil glee in what they were doing it would at least mean they cared. They don't even yeah, care. Right. That's what makes it care. so yeah. horrible. Uh, you know, the Aldani people coming up, uh, really great, uh, you know, really subtle things like the way that head Aldani uh, chieftain, priest, whatever he was, just the scorn that he had for the empire. Uh, you know, I, I hope that the eye uh can like you know like find good in you or you know like just the the and even the way the other people behind him were like oh shit he really went for it oh god damn what's gonna happen here like in little ways it just made them feel more real as a people and also allowed you to see the way that gorn um walks that fine line he's he's being an imperial officer but he's the only one that's even remotely respectful and even yeah. when the other imperials come down and you're having that whole moment of translation like he's like well i'm not going to say what you're saying to him and i'm not going to say what you're saying to him i'm going to try and make this run as smoothly as possible so again all the little pieces that we've picked up over the past two episodes in big ways and small ways all paying off to make this feel very very real and grounded we kind of know kind of to john's point we spent enough time with everybody that we understand why gorn is acting the way he's acting we understand why everybody's doing what they're doing as far as 
um, the plan and the execution. And Shannon can speak about this better than I can, but it's just really well done because it's clean. Yeah. The four of them are going to march the Imperials in. Gorn has set this up that they are going to be the ones that have them and they're going to take them hostage. And uh, Cinta and Vel. Uh, Vel. Vel, thank you. Yeah. And Cinta and Vel need to mess up the communications. They yep. need to make sure that nobody can like radio out. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. I um, feel like we get a little bit of a Jedi Fallen Order. Uh, I don't want to see Easter egg, but the way that they kind of get to the Imperial base is the yeah. same way that Cal Kestis gets yeah. to... Uh, Gets to the um the um, why am I blanking on everything's name? Uh, pa the imperial, the imperious, you know, yeah. Inquis those guys. Inquisitorium Thank Emporium. Inquisitorium, yeah. There it is, the Inquisitorium Emporium. <laughs> uh, all your Inquisitorious needs on sale. But yeah, like Cal Kestis, I very much remember like kind of swimming down there, and so when they were doing that, I'm like, yep, feels right, feels like Star Wars to me. Um, and then just watching it all fall into place, like. Yeah. Thus far, the plan is working really well. And so on the one hand, I was like, all right, this is really nice. I see where everyone's going. And on the other hand, I was like, well, I think we've got about uh, we got about 30 minutes left. So I feel like this isn't going to run smoothly. <laughs> yeah. Shannon, thoughts over on how they set everything up here and uh, put people in position uh, to where we're ag about to go, which is the heist. Um, you know, well... Vogel got a lot of it, but, yeah. uh, you know, the, the writing, because I believe it was Dan Gilroy, who's the credited yeah. writer on this yeah. one again. Um, just great, great dialogue, great back and forth. I mean, the whole, the almost backhanded compliment that Nimick has of Cassian, where mm. he's just like, you know, I'm nervous. You know, I've got my faith, I believe. He's just like, you, you got nothing. <laughs> you slept like a rock. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and then when, as he's basically, as Cassian is saying, the, the Empire doesn't care about you and they don't play by rules. Yeah. And Nimic saying, well, tomorrow they may think differently. And Cassian's like, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Because like, if this does work, you know, you, you want, you may have won a little battle, but the shit storm this is going to bring on, which is also kind of telling of Cassian's point of view. He's like, mm -hmm. I'm doing this and I'm out. Like, he's not sticking around. He's like, I know the, I know the hornet hornet's nest that we're poking right now. Yeah. So I'm going to do what I can to get paid and I'm going to leave. The discussion between the two Imperials, as Vogel was saying, was like, oh, this is just like colonization. Like, like we're going to show you all this stuff that you don't actually want. And, you know, we're going to kind of overwhelm you with this. And the whole time we're going to be taking what it is that you want. And the whole idea that they're giving them the illusion of choice. Like, yeah. like oh, we're, we're, we're trading these pelts for a three-year lease. Because honestly, it's like, you know, when we build our new facility... You know, there used to be 15,000 Donnies down here. Yeah. Now there's going to be 60. Yeah, He's like, but we don't. Now it's 60 now. Uh, yeah. It's like, we don't want to, we don't want to kill these people because yeah. they're the ones, it's going to be cheaper for them to build this thing than for us to build this thing. I mean, the, 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 the high wire that they're balancing. I mean, there's a reason that they, you know, they ruled the galaxy mm -hmm. for so long. And I also thought it was interesting how they um, were really kind of humanizing J-Hold. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, showing that he has a wife, showing that as a kid, like his wife is like, ah, you know, I don't like it here. Like yeah. we need to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. All the setup was just great. And like that, that shot of Vel and Sensa under the water. Yeah. Aside from being just a beautiful shot with that one sort of, you know, comet oh. going above them. Yeah. Um, just illustrating just the two of them, like how isolating this type of work is yeah like i thought it was really really well done yeah normally i'd be like why didn't they show them kiss but it was very well established their relationship and their affection for each yeah. other and you didn't need yeah. to show it which i thought worked and uh you know in other ways i think they've skimped out on showing some of the uh, connection when they had gay uh people as main characters in their shows it, and movies but in this situation it didn't need it and i like it's that it interesting you bring up a really good point and i just feel like as the homosexual, I'll respond to that. Um, but no, I, because, well, I think it's important because I think that so much of the time it feels like when people are protesting or getting upset about something, it's like, we really need to see a kiss. We have to see a kiss. Yeah. But this is just, it's so, like everything else in the show, it's so nice and subtle in the way that they've done it. And the way that like later on when Vel like, you know, touches Sinta's hand and is like, tell yes. me you'll be okay. Like, like the, I, I believe this relationship yeah. And this relationship is important to the dynamic of the team. Yep. So I would much rather have that and have this really real relationship that I believe in, that I genuinely care about these two yeah. uh, and what happens to them moving forward than having like some moment where 
you know, where, where we didn't even know that they were a couple. And then Vel's like, good luck, babe, and kisses her really quick and goes and we're oh, like, like, this is way more satisfying because it's real and important. And I think, you know, when you get, when we get into these conversations about what is uh, actual inclusion right. and actual uh, actual representation in the stories that we love and what feels like you tacked it on and what's pandering, right. this feels real and inclusive. It's all context. And people need to yeah. understand that. There's nuance here. In some shows and movies, they skimped on showing the kiss because they played it safe and they were afraid of the backlash. In other shows and movies, they don't need to do that because they've done such a great job establishing this relationship. This is one of those situations. There is a difference. Everything is a case-by-case -case basis when you look this stuff for sure. All right, let's move on to the heist here. Uh, speaking of Belle and Sinta, uh, do you want to Belle, we see... Oh, sorry. Do you want to take a break? Oh, sorry, right. take a break. All right, we'll be right back um, right after this. Do, 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 do. That's good. That's it's a peppy. Like it. It's a peppy theme for Andor right there. <laughs> All right, let's get into this. I'm gonna try to do this in 60 seconds or less. All right, Andor kicks off everything that goes on with the heist deal. They surround Jay Holden, his family, and the Colonel. The Colonel pulls his blaster on Nemec, but Vel and Cinta, who had been climbing down this thing after Vel's hesitation, which I thought was a nice moment to give some realism to Vel's journey as well as a leader here. Cinta is the one that comes down and shoots the Colonel. That's that. Uh, the soldier comes in to check with Gorn. He sends him down to the temple. Uh, it's, we see it's a little bit darker now. We see them take hold, take Jay hold to the vault, and he tries to protest. But they say, we're going to take your family hostage. And if you do anything, we'll kill them. He says, you're going to kill them anyway. Vel says to him, we're not the Empire, son. Uh, we got the Kimsey station, the and the device Vel and Sinta planted there is messy with the Kimsey's ability to monitor things. Terraman disables two of the guards. Andor walks in, gets two of the guys behind the council to move away from it. We cut to Gorn checking his watch. Is it wrong that I think he's going to die at this point? I thought that. Vel and the reigning Aldani 7 take hold of uh, Jay Holt, take Jay Holt's family on the elevator. Kimsey can't seem to fix the tech. Meanwhile, the ceremony is starting there with the Donnies. Nemec is schooling Sinta on the console board while Vel tells Jay Holt that he better cooperate. Vel shares a moment with Sinta, as we talked about. And I said, which one of these two will die? Kimsey is checking with another guard about the comms, and we hear that the, Al the Alkenzi line is still open. They arrive at the vault where some guards are playing a game inside. They come upon them, disarm the guards, while Jay Holt screams at them that it's not inspection but a robbery. Jay Holt urges them to cooperate. Skeen gets them moving to help them. We see Jay Holt's hand does open the gate. He screams that he won't be able to unlock the payroll, but Vel works the computer there, and the locks blow open. Open. Nemec tells Andor to go ahead, and he'll be right behind him. Skeen screams at the guards to move and load the payload. Nemec checks in with Sinta, but Kimsey overhears it, and that they should be prepped for Alkenzi to, Al to be calling in. So this is all going to be going sideways, sideways soon. Alkenzi calls in about a vault breach. The indicator light goes off. Sinta turns off at the power station. Kimsey leads a group of soldiers to the vault. We cut to the guards loading the payroll with even J-Hold helping them, and the tension is increasing. Kimsey is now in the station with the crew. We cut to the eye ceremony. It's gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Gorn comes in and Jay Holt sees it was Gorn who helped them. And he says he'll hang for this. And he says working for you for seven years would be worth getting a hanging, which is a really interesting exchange there. We cut to the Alkezi Air Command and three TIE fighters are being enabled. And then Kimsey comes in. Gorn tries to fool him. But then Jay Holt has a heart attack and will stop there. All right. Shannon, I go to you. Great. <coughs> I did. I think it's 60 seconds. Go ahead. Give it to me. Thoughts on it. Uh, one awesome. Like I love the moment that that door shuts and our Aldani four at this point, yeah, you four, know, pull, yeah. pull, pull their weapons. <laughs> and Jay holds like, where, where's Gorn? Where's Lieutenant Gorn? Like at this point, like he has no idea that Gorn is the reason that this whole thing is happening. Yeah. Um, the moment that the Colonel pulls the blaster saying, let the boy go. Like, again, they're humanizing, they're humanizing the empire, which is so you know, it, it, it's such a stark difference from what we've been presented in the past that yeah. it was like it was very much black hat, white hat, whereas this is they're they're the black hat. I mean, they're they're the bad guys. But it's still he's just like, look, let the kid go. Let the kid yeah. go. And the moment that uh, Senta makes that decision to just blast him. Awesome. Yeah. I love when they, the whole thing where he's just like, I I can't get you in that vault. Like, you know, it, it's it's operated remotely and Vel's like, you're full of crap. We know that's how it works. Yeah. If you don't take us down there, you know, we're going to we're going to kill your family. All we need is your hand. We can just take that. Shannon, she like, pulls a princess bride. Uh, give me the key. What key? Fezzik pulls his arms off. Oh, you mean this? Yeah. Key? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Basically that. I love it. I love when they get down there and the vault opens that you see those two guys who have like the Empire has a catering department. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's like, oh, well, you know, the, we, we, you know, we're letting the wine breathe right. Now. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> that all fantastic. You know, as they're watching, you know, the whole like loading, of, loading of the uh, the payroll, the schemes just I mean, again, his turn later is just such a heartbreak. And I'm not positive that he was actually bad but his his you know let's go let's go who here in the next 10 minutes doesn't want to hustle raise your hand like it was all just so exciting and the moment that the one of the uh, imperials outside hears the blast and they say to gorn like hey is is that okay it's like yep it's good it's good um so the design of the tie fighter docks now i don't know if that's been shown in a video game before I think that's the that's the first time we've seen it in live action, yeah. and that was the coolest thing. Yeah. I mean, watching how they you know they run across this you know kind of catwalk and they climb down, all just so 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 cool. And the moment that Nimick says, uh, "Go on, I'll be right behind you," I'm like, "Oh well, he's he's not making it." <laughs> and yeah, the yeah. fact that the plan almost went perfectly except for the overzealous radio operator yeah. Kimsey and the the moment that Jay hold he doesn't see Gorn he hears his voice when he says you know what are you still doing here what are you still loading you're supposed to be gone and how the blood yeah. drains from his face because it's not just the he, he's not just reevaluating the moment He's reevaluating his entire history with this guy. God knows what he's told him over those seven years, Shannon. That's a great point. I mean, just so, again, so incredible character moments that this is not a knock on any previous Star Wars because I love previous Star Wars. We just haven't gotten this before, and it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. All right, Mike, your thoughts on this whole setup here for the first half of the heist here before Kimsey comes in and starts to try to wreck stuff. Yeah, Shannon. Shannon spoke uh, spoke really well. Hit most of it. A couple things. One shot that I absolutely loved. It's so dumb. It's so little. But as right before everything kind of goes to shit, um, when Kimsey is looking at his monitors uh, and Vel and Cinta are up there, there's that shot of Vel just running, just like fucking sprinting across in plain sight of him. And yeah. it's so great because what we're so used to. And not just Star Wars, but most movies is, oh, I'm going to I'm going to hide here. I'm going to wait for my moment. I'm going to throw the rock and he's going to like this was just a no, this is what you got to do. Like you have to be totally out there and vulnerable and hope to God somebody doesn't fucking turn around. And I just thought that was such a real basic, easy moment, but something we don't usually see. Uh, and I think that really speaks to kind of the reality of the whole heist. Um you know, to Shannon's point about them humanizing the Empire, they are. I don't want anybody to think that that's like them being like, hey, let's let's feel bad for the Empire or think they're good guys. When you humanize them and not, not make them just that sneering, oh, you rebel scum. Like, the fact that these are real people and yeah. still do such horrible things and still commit such atrocities actually makes them worse. Yeah. Like, it actually makes them I mean, more the Nazi- horrible. The Nazis loved their families. I mean, for God's sakes. Yeah, it I mean, just yeah. and it just it just again it adds another bit of reality. Um, you know, when they all do get inside and pull the guns on those guys, Cinta Skeen was not lying last week when he was like, Cinta's cold. Cinta's yeah. Cinta's tough. Like, I just love that they cast someone who is so beautiful and let her be so quiet throughout this but kind of implied you know kind of said like look stormtroopers killed her whole family like yeah she is she is not fucking around she will kill any of these people when vel says to the guy when he's like look we're not you we're not the empire like we'll let people go i believe her i think cinta might uh but cinta's the first <laughs> one is gonna be like i'll kill this fucking kid i don't give a shit like and i kind of <laughs> love that um yeah yeah I also love the payroll was so impressive and mm-hmm. heavy and re- like you know like you we've we've seen a thousand times you know you open the safe and you see all the gold in the vault and the bars and whatever but just the way that they designed it these giant rolls and there was so many of them and it was so heavy and I literally was getting anxiety because they had all these guys loading up the ship loading up the ship and I, they kept cutting back to the safe yeah. And it was still so full. And I was like, do not try and get all of it. Just get out with what you like. I was getting actively anxious <laughs> because 
it was taking them so long to move everything back and forth. And, you know, so it wasn't like the, we see all the gold and we cut back 10 minutes later and they've got everything in sacks and they're trying to get it. Like they really were just like working this, like, guys, it's going to take a while to get that payroll in. And, and that's, and you know, everything kind of went wrong. Like you're right. Like Kinsey kind of like realized that he, he kind of logged in on that one thing, got the TIE fighters. Shannon's right. That shot of the TIE fighters and those guys jumping in it absolutely epic and fabulous and then just it was time you know even when the guy comes in and is so confused and Gorn's like this is a classified thing like there's just such confusion it's not they just run in and start shooting like it was confusing it was weird it was taking too long like there was so much going on and while all of this is happening we also have not for nothing one of the most beautiful celestial events that we've seen in Star Wars happening just outside Like, you know, like, like every time, like, you know, Shannon said that shot of uh, Vel and Cinta underwater with just the one flying over was gorgeous. And then you just get this moment where everything just comes over the mountains into the sky and everything they said about the eye. Everyone said, you know, we talk a lot about the buildup of the heist or the buildup of the characters, Mm. but they've been talking about the eye for like two episodes now. They're like, oh, this event is so big that nobody's going to look at it. Even the Imperial officers are like, you're really in for a treat. And when that happens, it actually is as impressive as they said it was, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Love the way they set this all up. Love the way they built the tension step by step, piece by piece, as they were doing the things they were doing. Love the separating of the family. Very, very smart. And you're right, Mike, that payroll. I kind of want to keep all my money in something like that and put it in the closet. Such a great construction of the payroll, which I thought was awesome. And also putting poor Jay Holt during the biggest loser workout. He's not going to make it. He's not going to make oh. it at his age. And you can tell when so when he had the heart attack, that was actually believable. He's separated from his family. Gorn has betrayed him, and now he's pushing all this heavy payload, and Kimsey comes in, so naturally it's too much for that old man's heart with his ever-expanding waist, and he fucking had a heart attack. So it totally worked for me as I was watching it. It wasn't It wasn't a cheap writing ploy. It actually worked in what they had built up, so I thought that was And it actually, really kind well of to done. your point, it, yeah. as we've been talking about, just really quick before we move on, like it yeah. actually, in addition to humanizing the empire and it's what Andor says about them to Luthen in, yeah. the, in the first arc, they're, the empire is not effective because they're so evil or they're so clever. Like they are literally fat and living off of everybody else and everything else. So the fact, you know, you could have just as easily had, yeah, and they're comfortable and they don't, they, they're just so like, they are so arrogant yeah. in their uh, ownership of the galaxy. And so like, could you have absolutely had him go, no, it's a robbery, he's a rebel scum and everybody starts shooting, totally would have worked. But the fact that he is this fat, out of shape guy that was so, looked down on everybody so much and like fucking had a heart attack. Like it just sort of, in addition to it being like a good plot moment to kind of get everything moving to the everything goes foobar, it also just is underscoring just the the casual, uh, unhealthy arrogance of the empire. It's true. And he cares about his family, which is why he tells them to help with the taking of the gold. So he does have a love for his family amidst all that uh, negative Mm. side of him as well, which makes him even more human. That's the truth. We always ask ourselves, how could these people have let this happen? This is how it happens. It's little I mean, micro. He did say he was gonna. He did say he was gonna backhand his son, but yeah. Well, I'm, I'm with you. to be fair, his son is Willem Blackwood. I wouldn't backhand him. Willem Blackwood being the guy in House of Dragon, who the young kid who uh, went after the older kid when they were suing for Rhaenyra's hand in that scene th- in episode three. I think that's the same ah! actor. Is it him? Yeah. That's, that's, funny. that's <laughs> really funny. <laughs> So you don't fuck with Willem Blackwood. So if he had done the uh, the hand swipe, it would not have worked out well for him. You show me the back of your hand, old man. <laughs> yeah, old man. I'll make you run around the room and you'll be dead. Quick. All right, we'll be right back um, right after this. Dead. All right, let's move on to the end of this. So the battle breaks out between them. Andor goes in to get the ship ready to fly, but a guard goes in after him. Vel is pinned down. Terramin is Then Terramin is shot. Called it. As soon as I said former Stormtrooper, I'm like, this guy's dead. And sure enough, he gets shot. 
Namek shoots the guard to free Andor. Andor gets the thing moving. It takes off against the night sky, but not before Namek is hit by the payload, right? I can't wait till I get back to the States, Johnny. I'm going to see that the ball game. Yeah, exactly. Um, Namek can't feel his legs. Andor needs a fly path. And now we and and now we see Vel pull a Pulp Fiction and get Nemec kind of awake here to give him directions. Um, and Nemec is guiding him, even though Andor doesn't believe him. He tells him to, to climb, then tells him to dive, what vector to hit. And the TIE fighters are each taken out. There's three of them, each taken out by flying debris. This is one of the most gorgeous action scenes I've ever seen in my entire life. Susanna White, I can't say this enough. Give her a fucking feature film right now to do in Star Wars. It was incredible, these three episodes that she directed. We see Vel, Skeen, and Andor debating about what to do with Nemec. Vel does not want them to go to the Doctor, but Andor makes the decision they go to them. We cut to the Doctor, who seems to be related to a Maz Kanata species or a Babu Frick species, <laughs> but maybe something new. We don't know. Multiple hands. Skeen and Andor are outside, and they start talking about Nemec's chances and the concept of luck. Skeen talks about the $80 million that they've possibly taken they are from the payload. He pitches Andor on splitting the money and walking away. Andor flies and Skeen pitches a place that they... Andor would fly the ship and uh, Skeen knows a place they can hide out in. Skeen tells him he doesn't have a brother and he is telling him where they can go and that he is just like him trying to connect to him saying we both would climb over bodies just to survive. And as he's talking, uh, he uh, Andor pulls a solo and shoots first. Uh, but there's no proof now that Skeen has made this offer, so we cut to Nemec, who has died on the table. Very sad. Andor tries to explain what happened as he walks in with his gun out, with his blaster out. Vel doesn't believe him. He said he only wants his cut and to leave. He offers 30000 to the doctor to take his ship. The doctor's not happy about this. A uh, heat moment. Give me your shirt. Gives her the Kyber crystal to give back to Lothan. Vel gives him Nemec's manifesto, says he Nemec wanted him to have it. We cut to the Imperial base, and Partagas has called an emergency meeting. He wants every star sector and planetary emergency retaliation plan ready for the <coughs> presentation by midnight. We cut to the Senate, and Mon Mothma's lobbying for a bill to help the Gormans, and we know how important the Gormans are going to be in, in Mon Mothma separating out from the Senate and becoming a leader in the rebellion. We cut, and, and everyone is getting notices about it on their tablet. The Senate is almost three-quarters empty, which tells you once again, Mike, as you said, comfortable, fat, and happy, these people, with the Empire situation. We cut to Lothan place and a customer's look at some items he says there's an inscription on one of them suddenly a man asks for something from aldani because the rebel attack is all over the news lothan goes back in the back and he proceeds to walk back there and let out a big old laugh all right mikey that is the end of the episode what do you think about the second half of the battle here skeen's turn uh and, and mon mothma radagas and yeah. um and uh, lothal Lothal. Uh, look, I think that, um, I mean, you're right. Like the, the entire escape, the entire, the entire them getting out of there and or like pulling the thing and the thing dropping and going up through the tubes. Like it was just all, it was thrilling. Even the way, like, you know, those dudes were not buckled in and just no. all of them flying backwards as that thing takes off. And then, I mean, as far as like bad planning goes, like don't have Nemec be the only guy that knows how to navigate out through <laughs> that celestial event. I mean, they like, like, Vel pumped him full of Pulp Fiction because <laughs> nobody, like he was like, he was the only one. I was like, come on guys, that is, have some backups here. But, uh, you know, <laughs> thrilling sequence, just watching them go up and down through that thing and just seeing them navigate it. And then just them, like you just like, when you saw that opening and Andor like went for it and the TIE fighters were going down, like it was, it really was just absolutely thrilling and awesome. Yeah. Um, and then here you start to see where Andor kind of falls in this middle, like Vel is 100% about the mission. Mm -hmm. And it is super important to the rebellion to get that money. And she does not want to go and help Nemec. And this is sort of what humanizes Andor for us a little bit. Like the mission is important, but he's still going to do what he believes is right, which ultimately is what he does in Rogue One. His mission in Rogue One is to kill Jin's father and he can't do it. Like there's this, there's this element of him that even though he's part of the rebel Alliance, he's in good ways and bad ways. Like he's what, he's what you actually want a good soldier to be. Like we say, you just, you say you just want a good soldier who's going to follow orders, but you also want a soldier that kind of inherently knows what, what should be done. And here he does the right thing. Um, and we think Skeen's doing the right thing too. 
Uh, turns out, not so much. I'm curious to hear Shannon's theory on why he thinks Skeen is not a bad guy. <laughs> I, think Skeen, I think Skeen is pretty explicit on where he stands on everything. And I literally had this moment, like when Andor just shoots him in the middle of what he's saying, I was like, I gotta remember that. I don't know why I feel the need that I need to remember this, but I feel like I'm the type of person that's gonna let somebody finish what they're saying and then really want to get the last word in before I shoot them, which is probably the thing that's gonna get me shot. Like, I just love that he was like, he was like, so then here's what we're gonna do, boom. Yeah. Like, no warning, no nothing. Again, um, the same thing that Andor does when we first meet him in Rogue One. So nice to see how they're taking these elements that we saw in Rogue One and we're kind of seeing that be a part of his personality and how he deals with things. Yeah. Um, and it didn't even really occur to me until he walked into the room with Vel that I was like, oh, fuck, this doesn't look good. Like, like it, I didn't realize how it was going to look until yeah. he walked yeah. in. Yeah. And then it was a really interesting um, back and forth. Like, obviously, Vel wouldn't believe that about Skeen. Like, obviously, she wouldn't think that. She spent so much time with him and so little time with Cassian. Right. And then, but then for Cassian to do kind of in the same way last week, where he like came clean about being a mercenary because he knew that honesty was the best way. The fact that he was just like, look, I am just taking what I was owed. There's so much money there, and he's only taking that little bit that he was promised. Yeah. And I think that does turn Vel a little bit. And then she gives him Nemec's book, which I think, I don't remember if it was Shannon or Johnny or whoever, but there was like, Nemec's book is going to be really important. Yep, you were right. I mean, this is, because he does, like he leaves, he's out. So yep. we're going to start episode seven, not with Andor getting further into the rebellion, him still being like, I'm not a part of this. This is not my jam. Um, and then as I was saying earlier, like I really do feel like when we see the, you, when you see the reaction um, mm -hmm. at the ISB, the, the the Imperial Security Bureau with everybody and just this all hands on deck like they they've not dealt with this before the, these these rebellions yeah, even like it, even, right? even um even you know in the previous weeks uh as, as we've been looking with uh with Deidre and what she's been dealing with like yeah. she's here talking about there's a bigger thing at play there's a more organized thing happening and everyone's like yeah that's your gut but like you have no proof of that this is the proof. Like this is so big and the way that they don't, they don't have anybody say it, but the way the ISB responds and mm -hmm. then you get to the Senate, which like you said, looks like a very depressing Senate. Yeah. Um, and just seeing everybody <laughs> just grabbing their tablets and Mon Mothma kind of noticing it and just everybody reacting so uh, in such a big way. And then with Luthen, just the way that dude was like, you have anything from Aldani? And like the way they shot it and the way they did it, we had the same reaction that Luthen did. Like his his butt clenched. He was like, "Oh fuck!" They, they, they know, they know. And then it was just this guy that was like, "Oh yeah, everyone's talking about Aldani. Some big rebel thing happened there." Like just the the reaction to everyone is like, "This hasn't happened before." Yeah. This is a this is a big deal. Uh, and I thought that was such an interesting interesting way. And then just really sidebar, kind of like Star Wars Easter eggy. Mm. To your point, John, I do think it's really great that they've given Mo in Mon Mothma's first arc here that what's happening with the Gorman trade routes and everything is the thing that she's doubling down on because, yeah. as you said, like if you're a viewer of Star Wars Rebels, ultimately the thing that puts Mon Mothma on the outs with the Senate and with the with Palpatine is that there is a Gorman massacre. Yeah. And Palpatine orders a bunch of Gormans to be killed, and she comes out in the Senate and totally l blames him and lays that at his feet, and then she becomes a criminal. So the fact that we're seeing this building thing as she's really trying to fight for the Gormans, like this is going to lead all the way through towards what happens in Star Wars Rebels, which I think is, again, as we talk about Easter eggs, is really subtle and not like hitting you over the head, but using what happens in the other Star Wars mediums to really sort of uh underscore these characters in this story which is really great great shannon thoughts on the back half of this battle here as and then what happens with skeen and andor and then uh, uh the stuff at the end here with the isp i mean th the thing that really stuck out is with uh Terramin and gorn both getting getting shot and killed um was the normalness of their deaths like mm. it wasn't this big heroic like go, go on without like, me. it was 
it was it was what would happen like yeah. it was like you get shot you're down like that's it um the the uh craft the the trawler getting sort of propelled through that tube again super oh. cool design yeah. watching i mean this was I, I i don't feel like i've had in star wars a flight sequence as thrilling as this since um the meteor the the asteroid field and empire yeah. strikes back um yeah like as Cassian's looking around, when, uh, yes, the 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 uh, adrenaline shot that they give Nimic was really something else. Um, but him just saying, "You know, climb, climb now, climb now," and he's like, "Are you looking?" Like, no, like that's that's a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> but then cutting over inside the ties cockpits, and you see how all of the interference that the that the uh, you know meteor shower is sort of uh, giving all their instruments. Like it's just really 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 good filmmaking like I, I don't know like in terms of the writing this would be a couple of lines like mm. cassian looks out the window he's surrounded by by uh comets you know the you know the tie pilot looks at looks at his screen all the instruments are, are are scrambled being able to so uh thoroughly you know put that on screen in such a thrilling way it's like again Susanna White just did yeah. really 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 great job um and like I, I don't have a theory as to why skiing is a good guy I think it was more just a hope like no buddy no like is this another test for Cassian to, and I'm like well you're on the other side of the mission there would be no reason to do this it's so true yeah. So it was more just kind of a bummer uh, that I was like, oh, man, I really thought I really thought you were going to be a good guy. But then, you know, you can you can see the expression in D uh, Diego Luna's face and Cassian's face after he shoots him that if he says yes to this plot, he's he's going to die. Like yeah. Skeen's going to double cross him. If he says no to the plot, he's going to die like Skeen's mm -hmm. going to kill him right then and there. So the only option he yeah. had was to shoot him mid sentence. And then yeah. as soon as that's happened, that was the that was the part he didn't get to was like, shit, how do I explain this? Yeah. Um, going inside to the doctor, that forearm doctor, hmm. like, I don't know how they did that. Because it, it was all, it sure looked all practical. Uh, it almost looked like there was another uh, yeah. puppeteer behind oh, them baby. with their arms oh, out man. front. But yeah. the arms are so close. Like, yeah. I don't know how that would have worked. But I mean, knowing Tony Gilroy's um, affinity for shooting as many things practically as he could, I was like, that is such a cool, cool design. Yeah. Um, but I feel like the moment that Cassian did kind of went over Vel was that kyber crystal where he's mm -hmm. like, give this back. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> yeah. even Luthen said, like, you you hold on to that. Like, that's, you know, I, I want it back. But if you get into a jam, that's something like, that would have helped him. But, you know, even though Cassian, um, you know, he, he he's not a hero by definition, he has honor. And he's yeah. like, this isn't mine. I did my job. I'm taking what's mine and I'm going to go. Yeah. Um, love the moment that everyone gets the SIG alert on their phones <laughs> in the Senate. The and, yeah. and yeah, the, the, I, the, the butt clinch moment, that was something uh, that I, that I note, notated as well. The moment where he's like, how about anything from Aldani? <laughs> and he's like, <laughs> and I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> but then as he's he's walking into the back like you can hear the guy like i watch it with the uh with the subtitle yeah. but you can hear the guy be like you know i was kidding <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but that moment of joy in luthan's face to think all right we did it we're still in the game i mean yeah. just a great episode yeah yeah i absolutely loved the back half of the battle loved how that all turned out i did call nemic dying so that was not a surprise mm -hmm. to me I, I, I called the scheme turn on another show, the resistance broadcast system last week when they asked me to come on to talk about episode five, I had a weird feeling about scheme. So I knew because the person who is the most suspicious is usually the person who's going to turn in my opinion, because they don't know that the other new person. And so they don't, they haven't been able to snow that person over quite yet. And the fact that he threatened his life and it just seemed that that's where they were going. I thought Bell or Sinta were died though. And neither one of them did. Sinta stayed, which is very yeah, curious. I'm worried about Sinta. Yeah. Is she going with the Donnie's or is she going to find her own path? 
Arvell and Sinta going to meet up at some point with that 80 million? They're going to transfer to Luthen and, and that's that. I don't know. So I have questions here, which I really like. I like that there are some open end because this is a 12 episode season. So it doesn't because I think we're going to go back to Ferrix in the next three episodes and then maybe meet back up with Vel and the rest of the crew in the bottom. Half. We'll see. I don't know because we've still got Saw Guerrero to come at some point. So we'll see. But overall, great, great stuff. To I mean, the heist from top to bottom was great. Also, I don't know if this is intended. On, you know, sometimes I read into things. A little symbolism here. Nemec giving the manifesto to um, uh, to Andor, which is I think is going to change him and move him towards the rebellion. And we don't know if he's going to broadcast that all over the place for because clearly the hollow net isn't limiting what stories are being told if they're letting that rebel story come out depending on how they twisted it who knows but now we've got this thing with the with the um with the manifesto so he's going to be clone closer to the rebellion nemec guiding him through the asteroid is symbolic of nemec's manifesto possibly guiding andor through the rebellion and becoming a part of the rebellion because there are many asteroids he could hit trying to get to where he's going so I that, think is, that is much that is much less of a stretch than some okay. of your other symbolism sometimes <laughs> i'll give you that one that one uh that, that one works that one works thank you very much okay, but, <laughs> <laughs> but i like that radagast is getting involved here this means deidre is going to now become more of a central part of that particular storyline and we're going to see blevins move to the side she is now going to be so much more yeah. relied upon i think as we go forward and that's going to swing us right back to Cyril as well at some point in these next three episodes, I believe. So great, great stuff here. Can't sing Susanna White's praises enough. The music here was fantastic as well. The score, the, the, the music cues were fantastic. The action, the editing, the cinematography, all of it just worked so well. And that ending was so perfect there with Luthan. Like, ha, ha, ha. You know, just... <laughs> So oh great. God. So overall, full, full, just... full Dorothy's Bornack at the end there. He was just <laughs> living his best life. He was very happy. <laughs> All right, let's wrap it up there. Final words, because I know we got to go here in like uh, five minutes. Mike, fi final words on this episode and where we're going next. Um, yeah, just really great episode, really great arc. I mean, I think we've had two really, really strong arcs, arcs here. And I, what I love about this is, you know, Cassian's the big question mark here. Like, we don't yeah. really know where he's going from here. He doesn't really have anywhere to go. Maybe he does try and go back to Ferrix at this point with the money. Like, maybe that's what brings it in. Deidre, I think, just based on things we've seen in the trailers and based on the fact that she was right... I think that if she's going to try and start tracking this stuff down, she's probably going to start with Ferrix. So I think we're going to probably get Deidre going there. Cinta and Vel, I mean, I, I'm very worried about Cinta. Like I said, I'm, 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 I'm into this Cinta-Vel situation, yeah. and I want, to, I want to know where they go. And then I think that, you know, what we're going to see now is everything's going to get more intense after this. I think Mon Mothma didn't know about this plan that Luthen was doing, so she's probably going to have some opinions about that. Um, I think that I'm more and more convinced that the person that she's bringing in, that she thinks she should bring in, is mm. probably Saw Gerrera. We yes. know he's coming. Oh, good point. We yeah. know that there's going to be a period of time where they all do work together and then realize that this is not a good plan. So maybe she's the one who thought Saw was good, and that's what brings him into all of this. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the Empire is doubling down. People are talking. This rebellion thing is getting more serious. And with all of that going on, Andor is going to have to make some decisions. So I think it's going to be really, really interesting to see what these next two arcs are. Agreed. Uh, Shannon, thoughts on uh, final thoughts here as we wrap up uh, 60 seconds or less, my man. Yeah, outside of a quick little snippet of Deidre, I don't think we've seen, or yeah. and Saw Guerrero, we haven't yeah. seen anything that's going to happen in the next yeah. six episodes. So that is that is very, very exciting. I mean, who knows if Cassian even leaves that planet? I mean, who knows if Bell doesn't stop him at the beginning oh, yeah. of next episode? Um, but either way, like I do agree that it's going to be the writing of Nemex that ultimately gets Cassian into the fight for real. Yeah. Um, yeah, everything. It's just it's a super satisfying series. I've read that it's not doing the best numbers for Disney Plus, which is a shame because yeah. I think it's really, really good. And it just stems from the fact that it's Star Wars, but it's not it's not anything that it, that has it has really you know uh, uh, preceded it outside of Rogue One. So I, I hope that folks give it a shot because this show is is dynamite. Yeah, I mean, someone tweeted about this show being the greatest, this, some of the greatest stuff they've ever seen. I'm telling you right now, if they stick the landing on this first season, this is going to rival Empire Strikes Back as my favorite thing Star Wars has ever done, ever, ever. 
because I'm loving the pacing, loving the writing, the direction, the reality of this. And, you know, some people just default to the pew pew stuff. And I respect that. Uh, but to me, this is what I've been dying to see since they bought uh, the rights. Disney bought the rights. A new approach to this that feels more grounded. Nothing against the other stuff. This one I just love a little bit more. It connects to me more. And this episode is further proof of why for sure. Uh, all right. Well, there we go. That's our spoiler review for this episode. The I episode six of Andrew. We're moving on to the next three episode block here. It's going to be a lot of fun to keep doing it. Uh, Laura Kelly, we miss you. We wish you were here. We'd love to hear your thoughts. So Laura, if you respond to this or respond to our tweets about it, let us know your thoughts about it for sure. Um, uh, Shannon, what do we have to tell? Yeah. I'd like to follow us on social media on Twitter. It's at geek underscore buddies on Instagram at the underscore geek underscore buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore McClung on Instagram at Shannon, the geek buddy. If you would like to follow Mr. Vogel, it is at MK tune. If you would like to follow Mr. Roca, it is at the Roca says Mikey. Uh, well, look, we clearly love talking about Star Wars, and we love you listening about Star Wars. So if you want to continue on this Star Wars journey with us, here is what you can do to help that happen. Uh, hit that like button below. Subscribe to Johnny's Outlaw Nation page. Check out all the amazing content he's got there. The more subscribers he has, the cooler he looks. And we Please. want him to look as cool as possible. Um, leave some comments below. Let us know what you thought of this episode. What did you think of this latest arc of Andor? How do you feel Andor is stacking up to other Star Wars shows? And where do you think Andor's journey is taking him? Let us know below. If you are listening to us on podcast, go ahead and take a minute. Leave us some stars. Put some comments there. It helps us go up in the rankings so more people can find our geeky little podcast. And if you are not doing that, the other thing that you can do that is super helpful is to retweet this video, post it on your socials, send it to your friends, and tell them to hang out with your buddies, the Geek Buddies. There you go. Um, all right. And big shout out to Carbon Health. Continues to power and sponsor us here on the Geek Buddies. Head on over to CarbonHealth.com for all your healthcare questions, concerns, or needs. They want to have four-armed doctors, but they got a couple of two-armed doctors that will help you out for sure with any concerns you got. Get COVID tested, urgent care, uh, in-person care, virtual care. They got it all. So go get uh, go check them out. Also, download the app if you like to handle it that way so you can find it. You can find a nearest center near you and have a doc in your pocket for sure. All right, that's it from us. Y'all take care of yourselves. Be well, and we'll talk to you next time with another brand-new episode, spoiler review episode from The... Geek Buddies!